Inspired by the successes of his seminal work Master Karataka, Jordan Mechner returned to video game design in 1989 with the birth of a much more impactful franchise. Originally released on the Apple II, then ported to virtually everything it could run on, Prince of Persia could be seen as groundbreaking in several ways. Certainly, it was one of the earliest attempts at a simulation of motion capture in a video game. It wasn't strictly speaking true motion capture, which wouldn't appear until the early 90s with games like Virtua Fighter. Gone was the staccato simulacrum of human movement we saw with Karataka, sprite animation was modelled in a radical new way, and it showed. The characters' actions were smooth as silk in a way that, in 1989, had not been seen before. Storyline-wise, nothing radical here, but that wasn't the point, and credit can at least be given for transposing this story to a somewhat untrodden time period placed, loosely at least, in our own human history. For sure, famous franchises such as Tomb Raider and Assassin's Creed take a ton of inspiration from the atmosphere created in Prince of Persia. Set in medieval Persia, now Iran, you control an unnamed protagonist, tasked with venturing through a series of dungeons to defeat the evil Grand Vizier Jafar, who, in the Sultan's absence, rules with an iron fist of tyranny. One obstacle remains between Jafar and the throne, the Sultan's beautiful young daughter, who has been imprisoned somewhere in the dungeons as well. You'll initially see a cutscene showing the imprisoned princess being accosted by Jafar himself. She bats off his approaches, causing him to place an hourglass in front of her. Marry Jafar, or die within the hour, he opines. And that's exactly what the game is about. You are the brave youth she loves, equally imprisoned in Jafar's labyrinth, and you have precisely 60 minutes to find her. It's a save the princess storyline, but this time it feels a lot more motivated. The reason more crucial than some ham-fisted love story, the sense of urgency more definite as that clock ticks ever down. The first thing that strikes you is just how gosh darn good this game looks. Every conceivable movement is beautifully rotoscoped, from jumping and running to climbing up platforms and sword fights. The attention to detail was not only bestowed on the character, but also the setting and backgrounds. Flames, spikes, and so on are all superbly animated. It's a black background game, however, so it can be a little tricky to view on the Dot Matrix GBs. Play it on anything Game Boy Color or later, and it looks gorgeous, and as smooth as any home computer version out there. You get three hit points to start with. This can be extended by drinking enough of these potions that you'll find around the place. The level layouts are varied and non-linear. You'll often have to find floor switches that open gates somewhere else, navigating in all four cardinal directions around this temple maze with plenty of backtracking. There are death traps all over the shop, whether retractable spikes or inescapable pitfalls. And you'll die a lot, believe me. It's one of those games where you have to learn the layouts and the routes. So often will a piece of the floor disappear, causing you to plummet to your death. There are no real indicators which part of the floor are unstable. The animation may be buttery smooth, but at times this is at the expense of the player inputs. The controls do feel very stiff and not entirely intuitive. For instance, you jump directly upwards by pushing up, but jump forwards by pressing A. I feel that pressing A plus a direction would have felt more natural, but maybe I'm looking back at it too retrospectively. Early on, you'll find a sword which you'll need to use to kill certain guards. At first, these are human, and relatively easy to beat once you get the weird timing right. Later on, there are ghost guards who you can't damage directly, but instead have to force backwards off of platforms to kill. The sound is not as polished as the graphics, but then that's the case in basically every iteration of this game. It's uninspiring to say the least, and a little abrasive at times. There is little music, instead your footsteps, crashes, sword strikes all have their own little sound effects, with tunage reserved for short jingles when you smite an enemy or find level transitions. That brings me to a saving grace that helps quell the difficulty. If you find a stairwell, you'll be given a password that'll allow you to start again from that point should you die. I'm very conflicted about Prince of Persia, possibly more so than any other game in this chronology so far. For an early adventure title, this is not a flawless piece. The controls are tricky to get down, being as sluggish as they are. 
Having said that, I have a ton of admiration for all involved, for managing to get Prince of Persia on the Game Boy and being able to keep it this consistent. Like I say, it looks phenomenal for the time and it gets a lot of credit for that. But for some reason, probably the controls more than anything, once you look past that delectable veneer, the game isn't really that fun to play. All the ingredients are there, but you never feel like you're getting your teeth into the meat of the matter. As with everything I've talked about, however, these remarks are not unique to this port. They apply to every version out there. The Game Boy iteration is faithful to what this game feels like regardless of how you play it. Frustrating, insanely difficult, cheap deaths are plenty. But at the same time, gorgeous, atmospheric, and most crucially, original. You never played a Game Boy game like this before 1992, I guarantee you.